Praise God. What a day. Yes, already. It is a good day. Amen. It is a joy to be here with you today on this Reformation Sunday. I'm excited to get into the things that we are uh, going to be preaching about over the next uh, few weeks. And I get the privilege of starting us out. I've got a tail. Um, I've got the privilege of starting us out. And uh, John is going to be preaching next week. Then I'll preach again. Then Joel's going to preach. And then John is going to finish us out. And so it's kind of an exciting thing even just to be collaborating over the next several weeks together on these topics. And, uh, you know, Reformation Day, October 31st, is something that rolls around every year, believe it or not. Every year we have an October 31st, and every year we get to celebrate one more year of God's faithfulness and grace towards us. And I love what John was praying. We, we are not here to introduce anything new, uh, but to recover that which is old, that which is ancient, that which has been the teaching of the church since the inception of the church. The things that we're going to talk about over these next few weeks were not something that were developed by Augustine or even by Luther or Calvin or any of the other names that you might hear over the next five weeks. They're things that were taught by Jesus, things that were taught by uh, the Apostle Paul, the Apostle John, and are encoded for us in uh, the Holy Spirit breathed out, inspired, inerrant, infallible Word of God in the Scriptures. And yes, there is room for discussion and debate. Yes, there is room to uh, look at these things, investigate these things, and ask uh, where there might be doubts or confusions, or is this merely an interpretation, or is this truly what uh, the Holy Spirit meant when He inspired the text. And those are some things that we're going to be talking about. But again, this is not to introduce anything new. It's not to introduce anything new to the church at large, the, the global Catholic universal uh, church that we are a part of, that is made up of every single person who has ever or will ever uh, Believe in Jesus Christ for salvation. That is the Catholic Church, the universal church. We're not to introduce anything new into that, but we're also not introducing anything new to Redemption Hill. And so if you've been here for a while and any of this sounds new to you, please know it's not. Uh, we're not, we haven't, you know, we didn't go away to some conference and come back all jazzed up and decide that we were going to try to introduce something new to the church for the last almost 10 years now. Uh, these have been the truths that we have been preaching from the pulpit as a part of Redemption Hill. However, what we are going to do over the next five weeks is actually label them in ways that we haven't labeled them in the past. And we're going to do that for your benefit and help. Um, just to give you a little bit of a backstory, I was not raised uh, believing the things that we're going to be teaching over the next five weeks. I grew up in the Pentecostal and charismatic movement. The churches that I was a part of would trace their lineage back to an event in Southern California called the Azusa Street Revival. And much of my upbringing uh, was in that culture and in that world. And, and so uh, we were happy to be called Protestant. Uh, we would even celebrate people like Martin Luther in history to say, hey, he did a good thing because if he didn't, we wouldn't be here right now at all. And that was true. But if we were to get into the teaching of Martin Luther or the teaching of some of the great pastors and theologians that followed him, uh, then we would have been where I grew up in what we would have thought of as dangerous waters. And, and so very much I grew up in a place that was constantly trying to bring something new, find something new, uh, deliver something new, uh, instead of going back and recovering what the church has been teaching all along. And so uh, I was pastoring here in San Antonio, a different church. Uh, for five years before we planted Redemption Hill. And as 
Time progressed in the five years that I pastored that church as a very young man. Um, my theology began to change. And it wasn't changing, again, because I went to a conference or because I listened to this person or that person. In fact, what was happening is I was spending a great deal of time uh, in the book of Romans, uh, in the book of Colossians, in the book of Ephesians, in the book of Galatians. And as I was reading through these Pauline epistles in the New Testament, some of the things that I had held on to all of my life began to get shaken up. And then what would happen is I would talk to some of my friends and I would be discussing things and it would take me 15 minutes to describe something to them, something like what we're going to talk about today, which is the doctrine of total depravity. Uh, it would take me 15 minutes to try and even just introduce what I was trying to talk to them because I'm like, man, have you read? Did you read in John when Jesus says, no man may come unless the Father draws? Did you read in Ephesians chapter 2 where Paul says that we are dead in our trespasses? There's no one righteous, no not one, no one seeks for God, nobody in Romans chapter 3. Brother, have you read this? And And one of my friends in particular, I remember we were on the phone together, he's like, yeah, uh, but what you are describing is the doctrine of total depravity. I'm like, what is that? I, I don't know what that is. Um, and so what, what happens is as people within the church, their theology progresses and we learn collectively more and more about Scripture, there is a shorthand that we can develop to help us describe things. I'll give you an example that won't be a surprise to anyone here. Hopefully won't be a surprise to anyone here. The word Trinity. Anyone ever hear of the word Trinity before? Okay, this is a basic Christian doctrine. We believe in one God in three persons. The Trinity. But did you know that the word Trinity is not in the Bible at all? It is not a biblical word. It is a biblical doctrine. It's a biblical concept. It's a biblical idea. It's a biblical truth. The word Trinity is not a biblical word, meaning we didn't go to Scripture to get the word Trinity. But again, if you had to try, and I challenge you maybe today in your time together in our fellowship after service, try to describe to one another the Trinity without using the word Trinity. It's going to take you a little while. And so uh, there has been a great grace for us as people that as doctrine develops, we are able at times to put a label on something uh, that gives us a shorthand so that we can get to what we're trying to talk about sooner than taking the 15 minutes to try and describe what it is without just giving it a name. And so the Trinity is one of those kinds of shorthands that helps us that as long as we both mean the same thing when we say Trinity, and that's very important, Definitions are important. Sometimes you have to take time to define terms and make sure that two people are talking about the same thing. But as long as you're able to establish that you mean the same thing when you say Trinity that I mean when I say the word Trinity, now we can have a conversation. We can use the word Trinity as shorthand and we can get further, faster together by doing that. Does that make sense? And so there are lots of things like that in theology where we develop a shorthand that assists us in having these discussions together. And so some of the terms that we're going to use over the next five weeks may be new, even though the concepts and the ideas, the, the truths that we're going to be talking about are not new for us at all here at Redemption Hill. And so I wanted to just kind of preface all of that by saying that. And also to get back to the story I was briefly sharing about myself, I was in a place of angst and frustration as some of these things that I had been taught all of my life, I'm looking at the Word of God. Even though I was raised, and, and I will freely, openly say this, that I was raised to believe that the Bible is the inerrant, inspired, infallible Word of God. However, it just seems like when I was growing up, you could interpret it any way that you wanted to. Uh, and, and so I'm glad that I was raised in a place that had that kind of commitment to the veracity of the Word of God. 
But I was getting shook because there were things that I had been taught my whole life and as I'm reading the Word of God, I'm going, wait a minute. That's what I've been taught is not what the Word of God says. What I've, what I've been taught doesn't, is in contradiction, sometimes complete contradiction to what the Word of God says here and here and here and here. And it wasn't just a little bit. It was a lot. And, um, and I found myself in a season of angst and frustration. Um, quite honestly, I didn't know if, if I was even going to be able to remain in the faith at times. And uh, it was a, it was, it was, and by the way, I was pastoring a church. And I had to get up every week and preach. And I had to counsel people and pray for people. Um, and it was, it was really, really difficult, <laughs> to say the least. But through that time, God was faithful. And I decided there's Scripture that talks about um, let every man be a liar that God may tell the truth. And that's something that I held on to and basically came to a place where I said, if I am reading Scripture and I come to a place where I find that there is a contradiction between what I believe and what Scripture is saying, and, and this was kind of like a prayerful thing that I did, I said, God, you're right, I'm wrong. Your word is right, I'm wrong. And, and I, was, I had to become willing to surrender the things that I had been taught. I had to become willing to surrender the traditions that I had been brought up in in order that the Word of God may speak the truth. And, and I wouldn't sit there as I had been doing saying, but my experience has been, right? I would come to Scripture, I would read something, it would contradict something that I believed or held to, and I would try to uh, justify it by saying, well, but, but that, maybe that was for then, but my experience has been, and I had to even let my experiences in my own um, uh, accounting of them, in my own heart and mind, say even the things that I have experienced, I have to allow that perhaps those were a lie uh, so that as I read the Word of God, I'm not trying to justify myself by my own experiences, but rather let the Word of God speak and tell me what is right and what is wrong. When I got to that place, uh, I found a tremendous amount of freedom and hope and grace and rest that I had never known in my whole life. And so why would we come and, and say, hey, let's do five weeks on the Reformation. Let's talk about Reformed theology. Let's talk about these things. Let's use these terms. The reason is that out my heart and Joel's heart and John's heart is that all of us together could experience that kind of hope, that kind of peace, that kind of freedom to experience that grace and ultimately come to this place of rest in the finished work of Jesus Christ for us and in our place. This is kind of funny, uh, but in that time of great frustration, I was still in very much involved in the Pentecostal charismatic world. And I had some dear brothers who to this day, I love them, they love me. Uh, but I remember one of them coming to me and this would be strange language perhaps for us here today, but I remember one, uh, multiple of them, three that I'm thinking of right now, coming to me at different times, uh, which was also very frustrating for me, but coming to me at different times and saying, hey man, I, I don't know, I just, I've got this word, I just, I feel like it's for you, brother. Uh, and, and they even preface it by saying, I, I don't even know what this means or what it may mean for you, but you just need to rest just need to rest. And then the next guy was like, you just need to rest in the finished work of Christ. I remember asking him like, okay, yeah. What does that mean? He's like, I, I don't know, man. I, I just, that's what I feel like I need to share with you. You need to rest in the finished work of Christ. Here's the funny thing. He was right. He was very right. Um, but it took some time to flesh that stuff out. And so my hope is over these weeks that we would come to a place together uh, where that would not just be one person's um, experience, but collectively together as a body, we would be able to experience 
rest in the finished work of Christ for us and in our place. Amen? So today, uh, what I want to do quickly is I do want to look specifically at one text. And so we're going to look at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. And so I invite you to grab your Bibles, turn and open them to Ephesians chapter 2. My apologies for the long introduction, uh, but just trying to set the stage for what's going to take place over the next few weeks. Uh, But if we look at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, I encourage you to turn there in your Bible. When you find that, I'm going to invite you to go ahead and stand with me. We're going to read that out loud together. At the end of that reading, I'll say this is the word of the Lord and invite you to respond in true praise by saying thanks be to God. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. Let's begin. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with Him, and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages He might show the immeasurable riches of His grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. So here as we look at this text, Ephesians chapter 2, 1 through 10, it's a fairly familiar text, hopefully to most of you today. Um, I, I'm not expecting that this would be uh, a completely brand new text for you, but if it is, praise God. Here we go. Let's go there together today. Um, in these verses, what we are seeing is our unity with Christ. Uh, Paul is writing to the church in Ephesus, and he is writing, let me say it again, to the church in Ephesus. So when we read, and it says, among whom we all once lived, who are those who once lived? It's the church. It's the believers. It's the body of Christ in the church in Ephesus. And the distinction between them and what does he say? The rest of mankind is that they once were this way and now something has changed. What is that change? Well, it's a change that we really only know if we look back in chapter 1. So if you just look quickly over at chapter 1, verses 3 through 14, by the way, in the Greek are one long run-on sentence. Uh, There's almost a sense in which Paul is bursting forth in praise. This is called a doxology in the midst of the very opening of the book of Ephesians. And it's as if he is bursting forth. It's almost like he can't contain himself in the things that he's saying in Ephesians 1, 3 through 14. And so he bubbles forth. And what does he say? He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. Now, who is the us? It's Paul. He's the one writing. He's included. It's the nosotros, right? It's the us. It's the collective we. But who is the rest of the we? In verse 1, it says, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus. This is who he's writing to. They are the ones included in the us that Paul is talking about. And he's saying that the Lord... Uh, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ has blessed us in Christ, in Him. He's blessed Paul, and He's blessed the saints and those who are faithful to Christ in Ephesus. He says, with what? With every spiritual blessing. 
In other words, if you come to Jesus Christ in faith, there is not one thing that is left in some locked uh, container in a locked room in a locked building away from you that says, do not enter, authorize personnel only, stay out. There's nothing. Which means what? There should never exist inside of the church a sort of two-tier, first class, second class, upstairs, downstairs sort of dichotomy within the body of Christ. Because everyone is equal at the foot of the cross and the blessing, every spiritual blessing that can possibly be obtained is given in Christ to every single one of those people. Now, are there people who have a right to those blessings that sort of just leave them where they are? They don't explore them. They don't investigate them. They don't seek them out. Yes, there are. Will those people's Christian life and experience be different from those who spend their time, their efforts, their energy, their affections, exploring those blessings, investigating those blessings, searching those things out? Absolutely, it's going to be different. But it does not mean that these people are better than those people. It doesn't mean that their blessing is different than these people, except in that they received it. I remember one time I really, I was really young and we were traveling somewhere and I saw the most giant uh, lollipop I've ever seen in my life. And it was like really expensive. I don't even want to know how much it would be in today's dollars, but it was really expensive. And I asked, I begged my mom and dad for this giant lollipop. And because I just thought this, this is it, right? Like, I am the kind of, I want to be the kind of person that has this lollipop. Like I, my identity was about to be wrapped up in this lollipop. And I remember I, my parents actually said yes. And I got, and I was so proud. This giant, like swirly lolly. This thing was, it was awesome. I'm like, this is going to be great. But it's so great. I don't want to waste it by consuming it on a day that just like isn't special enough, right? So I remember I like protected it. I packed it away. I got it all the way home. We were traveling, bag stacked. I got it all the way home intact. And I remember I placed it in my bottom drawer in my desk and because I, I was saving it, right? Because I'm going to savor it. I don't want to. And it sat in my bottom desk drawer and it sat there and it sat there and it sat there and it sat there until one day a mouse found my lollipop and ate my lollipop and died. <laughs> and I never got to experience my lollipop. Right now, everyone, oh, right? Be sad for me. I'm sad for myself. I was a fool. Quite honestly, I was a fool. Because I had this great gift that came at a great price. And I squandered it by just leaving it in the bottom drawer. Now, it's a silly little anecdotal thing. But how often, we, we just read that every spiritual blessing is ours in Christ Jesus. And how much time do we actually spend trying to explore and savor those blessings? We often, myself included, I'm the guy that left the lollipop in the drawer, myself included, we squander it by not investigating these things. I've often said it to you like this. Consider uh, if you were, uh, if you inherited 3,200 hectares of land, beautiful hill country land. It was yours. You inherited it. Someone uh, passed it on to you in their will and it is yours. You sign the deed. It's yours. And you never go and explore that land. It's yours. No one can say it's not yours. But you know nothing about it. You've never gone out and explored the boundaries of that land. Figured out if there's caves or swimming holes or creeks or rivers or wells or, or 
trees that are how old or hills that have been there forever. You've never found an arrowhead or a, a petrified piece of wood because you've never gone out on this property and explored it. But how many people are living their Christian lives with this great inheritance that they've received from God in Christ by the Holy Spirit and they never explore these things. And so if you had inherited, you might say, oh yeah, hey, yeah, I got 3,200 hectares of land. Oh yeah, what, what kind of wildlife is out there? Oh, I, I don't know. Well, can, can you hunt there? I, I mean, I, I, I don't know. Well, why not? You 3,200 hectares, hill country, surely you can hunt out there. I, I mean, I don't know. Why not? Because I've never been there. You've never been there? Was there a house? I mean, I don't know. Like an old cabin? I mean, I don't know. Why? I've never been there. Well, could we go out there and swim? I don't know. Why not? Because I've never been there. I mean, I think uh, I've looked at the plat, man. There's supposed to be like some, some spring fountain thing there. I mean, I don't know. And what would you want to say to that person? Take off work. Let's go. Right? Like, let's go explore. Let's Man, let's hire a UTV. Let's get out there. Let's explore this place. You need to know what your inheritance is, right? And beloved, we have an inheritance in Christ. We need to know what it is. Paul starts to tell us. He says we've been blessed. He has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless in him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved, in Christ, in him, we have what? We have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace. We're going to stop there. I encourage you to go finish reading the rest in through Verse 14, I have a feeling some of this is going to come up in the next few weeks as well. But what was the difference between the, the, uh, um, in chapter two, uh, the difference between the rest of mankind and those that Paul is writing to? Those that Paul are writing to are the ones who have received this great blessing and inheritance. And specifically in him, they have, in Christ, they have what? received redemption through his blood. And so he draws a contrast. And if you look at chapter 1, you see this beautiful majesty of God's sovereignty in, in election and in predestination and saving and redeeming in calling out a people that were not a people but now are the people of God. You see the majesty of that. And then Paul goes to chapter 2. He says, now let me remind you of who you were without Christ. And that's where we picked up in verse 1, which was what? And you were dead in trespasses and sin. And this isn't Princess Bride. It's not only mostly dead. Okay? It's dead. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. And why is this so important? Because God's Word is important. And what did God say to Adam in the garden? On the day that you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall surely... But did he die? Trick question. Yes, he did. He didn't die physically, but he suffered a spiritual death. And this is the death, this is the dead that Paul is talking about. That everybody... And how, let, let's, let's make sure we don't get it wrong. How did he classify it? The rest of mankind. So in other words, who are they that are dead in their trespasses and sin? All of mankind. It's, it is an all without exception, right? There are different kinds of alls in scripture. So if any, if you ever hear anybody teaching, and, and I was guilty of this once upon a time, but you know, I was one of the all means all people, right? Well, unfortunately, all doesn't always mean all. And, and here is the distinction, which actually uses the word distinction. There is all without exception, and there is all without distinction. I don't know if anyone was around the last time that the Spurs won the NBA Finals. 
I remember I was with uh, some of these guys and the Spurs won the NBA Finals and San Antonio went nuts. And what were the headlines the next day? The whole city came out in the streets celebrating the Spurs win of the NBA Finals. Let me ask you, did everybody come out into the streets? No, I went out in the streets. My wife stayed at home in bed, right? It was not everybody, okay? That is what we call an all without distinction. It's hyperbole. It's meant to say a general truth without nuancing it uh, so that we understand what's happening. And we all do this all the time, right? We, we use this kind of hyperbole in our speech where we generalize things and we talk about all when we don't actually really mean all. And in Scripture, you have to be careful because sometimes all means everybody without exception, which means all people for all time, everywhere, no matter what. And sometimes it means generally all of these people. And so there's all without exception and there's all without distinction. And the mankind that Paul is talking about in chapter 2 here is an all without exception. It means everybody from everywhere for all of time. All of mankind are dead in their trespasses and sins. The only distinction, as Paul delineates here in chapter 2, are for those who are recipients of what he said in chapter 1. Those who by grace, through faith in Christ, have been redeemed. And so what is the nature of man apart from Christ? It is dead. And what is that death? That death is an inheritance that he has gained from his first father, Adam. And when Adam sinned, it did not just merely affect Adam. How do we know? Because Adam knew his wife Eve and she bore him a son and she named his name Cain because with God's help she had born a man by which she was pointing back to the promise of God where in Genesis 3.15 he said the seed of the woman shall crush the serpent's head and so she bears a man child and she thinks to herself, boom, there it is, the promise of God fulfilled. Cain's going to crush the serpent. Glory, hallelujah, we all get to go back and be with Jesus. But that's not what happened. Why was that not what happened? Because Cain had inherited from his father Adam what we now call the doctrine of original sin. That even though Cain wasn't around when Adam and Eve took of the fruit of the knowledge of tree, took of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Adam's sin was transferred to his progeny through his relations with his wife. And so Cain was the first one who was born dead in trespasses and sins. And if you follow the Old Testament text, you'll see very clearly, if you kind of zoom out and you look at it, what you see is there is a scarlet thread that is pulled through all of the text of the Old Testament from Genesis 3.15, from that word from God Himself, when He says the seed of the woman will crush the serpent's head, that thread gets pulled. And why do we have all of these, uh, what we sometimes think of as children's Bible stories, which really just Bible stories, and if you had to play them out in front of your kids, they would scream in terror and cry, okay, because they're real. And, and this scarlet thread is pulled throughout the Old Testament. Why do we keep looking at these young men in the Old Testament? Because every time one of these young boys is born, there is an inherent question in the text of Scripture, is he the one? Is he the one? Which one? The man-child born of the woman to crush the serpent's head. Is he going to be the one? And so what happens? 
Cain is born. Was he the one? No, he wasn't the one. Abel is born. Was he the one? Nope, he got killed. Seth was born. Was he the one? Nope, he just had a bunch of kids. And it goes on and on. Is Noah the one? Noah's not the one. Is Abraham the one? Abraham's not the one. Is Isaac the one? No. Ishmael? Nope. Okay, we just keep going. Jacob and on and on it goes. And I want you, even as you read those, I want you to feel that angst of going, is he the one? It comes to David and now it's, I mean, This is looking good. Shepherd boy protecting the sheep, protecting the flock, killing a bear, a lion with his bare hands, slaying Goliath with a sling. I mean, this is looking good. Then God Himself is like, man after my own heart. And everyone's like, is He the one? And at the time of the year when kings would lead their armies into battle, David was on his roof and saw Bathsheba bathing nearby. You'll have to go to Paul Harvey to get the rest of the story. Okay, but David was not the one. Daniel was not the one. None of the judges, Gideon, Samson, none of them were the one. Jesus is the one. He is the Messiah. The man, child, born of a woman to crush the serpent's head. He is the one. But every single other person was born in trespasses and sins. Dead. Spiritually stillborn. And how bad is it? Because it gets worse, doesn't it? He doesn't say merely that you were dead. What does He say? You were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of air, the spirit that is at work in the sons of disobedience. So, what is this? This is that you are what? Not only dead, you are bound. You are chained. You, you, you are being drug along following the course of the world. Drug along following the prince of the power of air, the spirit that's now at work in the sons of disobedience. You, you are being drug along by the world. Drug along by your flesh. Drug along by the devil to whom you are chained. And we're by nature, he says in verse number three, what? Children of wrath. That's pretty bad. Dead, bound, by nature, children of wrath. Which means what? From the moment of your conception and birth, you you have a one-way ticket to hell. That's what that means. And then verse four comes in but God. Now let me ask you, what can a dead, bound person do for themselves? Nothing. Nothing. They are dependent upon an outside force to come and act upon them in order to change the trajectory of their lives. And that is what God in Christ has done for all those who believe. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, did what? He made us alive together with Him, with Christ. This is regeneration. And before there can be faith, there must be generation. Regeneration. A dead person cannot believe. A dead person cannot believe. A spiritually dead person cannot believe. There is nothing within a spiritually dead person that would even cause them to want to believe. Why? Because what did we see? That their will, their flesh is bound. They're bound by their flesh. This is 
At the time of the Reformation, Martin Luther responded to Erasmus, who had wrote about the freedom of the will, basically planting his flag with Pelagius, who had been almost a thousand years before him. Uh, Pelagius was a British monk who uh, believed that we are born what he called tabula rosa, meaning a blank slate, that when you're born, you're neither good or bad, you get to choose. And, uh, and at the time of Pelagius, St. Augustine uh, responded to him, and uh, there were councils and courts within the church that determined that Pelagius was not just wrong, he was a heretic. Uh, it's why we still talk about Pelagian heresy. And Erasmus, basically a thousand years later, planted his flag in the Pelagian territory. And Luther responds with one of his most famous works on the bondage of the will. And here's the deal. At the end of the day, if you are dead in trespasses and sins, bound by the world, the flesh, and the devil, you cannot choose anything but what your deadness, your flesh, the world, and the devil want. One of the ways that this has been described uh, through Luther's writing is, let's just say we're going to suspend disbelief here for a moment. Let's just say that you were able to somehow communicate with animals like Dr. Doolittle, and you got a rabbit and a vulture together one day, and you prepared inside of this room, and, and you prepared this wonderful feast of fruits and veggies and all kinds of wonderful things, and, and then just some delicious, like a whole side of beef or, you know, steaks, whatever. On, and you separated them in the room, on each side of the room, and you get the vulture first. And you say, listen, vulture, I mean, you know, the world's not been kind to you. You're kind of ugly. Um, but wouldn't you like to see like an eagle? Wouldn't, wouldn't you like to soar like an eagle does? And I'm telling you that if you'll go in this room, I've prepared this whole feast of, of vegetables, carrots and, and, and different gourds and pumpkins and all these things that have all these nutrients, these legumes and all these things. And vulture, if you'll just come in here and you will consume all of these veggies, man, it's, gonna, it's just going to infuse you with all these vitamins and nutrients that you're, you're going to rise up from your station, bro, and, and you're going to take the vultures to the next level. And you're like, you ready? And he's like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm ready. And you open the door, you let the vulture in, wait a few minutes, and you go inside. What are you going to find? He went right for the steak, which I would too, but... That's neither here nor there. No matter what you could try to do to convince this vulture to eat the fresh fruits and veggies, by nature, he is bound to that which he actually wants, which is the meat. In the same way, if you took the rabbit, you're like, hey man, (laughs) this didn't go great the first time, but maybe I can get through to you. And dude, you're living the salad diet, but listen, if you would consume some of this grade A beef over here, man, you're going to get strong. You're going to be Arnold Schwarzenegger. bunny. It's going to be awesome. You're going to kick everyone's butt. You know, Mr. McGregor doesn't have a chance, Peter, if you'll come in here and eat this meat. And then you put the same bunny in the same room and you shut the door and you wait and you go inside. What are you going to find? Totally ignored the meat went straight for the fruits and veggies. Why? Because by nature, he is bound to that which he actually wants. So did the rabbit make a choice? Yes. Did the vulture make a choice? Yes. How did they make their choice? According to their nature. And if we are by nature children of wrath, if we are by nature born dead in trespasses and sin, bound by the world, the flesh, and the devil, then we have the same freedom to choose. If that's what you mean by freedom, Erasmus, then yes, 100% freedom to choose. We call that volition, which means what? God didn't sit there today and dance you around like Pinocchio, a little marionette, and tell you that you're going to choose these clothes to wear or those clothes to wear. You're going to eat this for breakfast or that for breakfast. You made the choice, and you made those choices according to that which you wanted, what you desired. You 
wore what you want, you ate what you want, or didn't, whatever, you made the choice. That is volition. You are not a robot. You, you are not being, not being dictated to. You are making choices. But the choices you are making are bound by your nature. And apart from Christ, Apart from God's work in your life, regenerating you and bringing you redemption by grace through faith in Christ, you are dead in trespasses and sins, bound by the world, the flesh, and the devil, and by nature a child of wrath, which means you can only choose that which will continue your path towards death, hell, and destruction. Well, does that mean that all the rest of mankind never does anything good? No. It's not what it means. What it means is that the good that they do, they do not in accordance with Ephesians 1, which is when God does good, how does He do it? According to the purpose of His will, verse 5, to the praise of His glorious grace, verse 6. That is what is truly good. Those things that are done according to the purpose of God's will and to the praise of His glorious grace. That is what is definitively good. Anything else is not actually good in terms of any kind of eternal and spiritual good. Now there are moral goods that we experience. And where are those coming from? Well, even though we were born dead in trespasses and sins, we are still born as image bearers. We have the Imago Dei, the image of God planted on us. And there are glimmers of the image of God that come out from all of mankind. And while we're dead in trespasses and sins, bound by the world, the flesh, and the devil, by nature children of wrath, still that image of God breaks through at different times. And so what do we see? We see sometimes... Pagans, even atheists, who will love their spouse and love their kids. And that's good. But it's not earning spiritual good for them. We, we can't look at that and say, oh, God should really look at that and decide to forgive them because they love their spouse and love their kids. No. Do we care that they love their spouse and love their kids? Absolutely. We look at that and say, in human terms, that's, that's good. I'm glad. I'm actually going to praise God that they're loving their spouse and loving their kids. But they're not justifying themselves before God by doing that. They can, they can stand up for good principles, things that we might even call godly principles, even if they don't want to call them those things. And that's humanly, morally good but it's not earning for them any kind of righteousness before God. It's not doing anything to get them off of that train of dead in trespasses and sins, by nature children of wrath, bound by the world, the flesh, and the devil, one-way ticket to hell. It's not doing anything to get them off of that track. The only thing, Paul made the distinction. What was it? He said, you once were these things. And were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But what was the difference? God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together in Christ. The only thing that moves someone off of that track is Jesus. He is the One. And so, we look at this and we say, okay, what, what does it mean to not have Christ? What it means to not have Christ is to be what we call totally depraved. Now again, totally can be a little bit misleading. It's kind of like the all. Does that mean, and we've just kind of discussed it a little bit, does that mean that every person is as bad as they possibly can be? No, that's not what it means. God's common grace restricts 
mankind in their sin. There are times that according to God's sovereign plan, He will allow certain people at certain times to uh, unload wicked evil on mankind. Those things are all going to be tallied up in God's plan at the end. Our job is not to look and say that's what everyone is. Our job is to say thank God we're not all there. Thank God that He is withholding sin. He's restraining sin in the world. So total depravity does not mean that we are all as bad as we possibly can be. Total depravity means that we are as far away from God as we possibly can be without any hope of changing our course without God Himself first working in our lives. And so we need His grace uh, to escape this track that we are on, dead in trespasses and sins, by nature children of wrath, bound by the world, the flesh, and the devil. And look at the work of God. We were dead in trespasses and sins, verse 1, but verse uh, number, excuse me, verse number five. Follow the progression, right? Dead, bound na- by nature, children of wrath. That's our lot without Christ. Follow the progression that Paul uses. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which He loved us, so it wasn't because you were good. It wasn't because He looked down and saw, oh man, hey Joel, he's awesome. I want him. Sign that guy up on my team. That's what we're going to do. No, the love was God's love towards us first, not because of anything that we have done, but because of who he is, okay? And so God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, verse five, even when we were dead in trespasses, what's the first thing he does? Made us alive together in Christ. So there's, there is this reversing of the order here that's happening. You were dead. God in Christ made you alive. What's next? By grace, you have been saved. And what? Raised us up with Him. Which means what? If you were bound, if you were dead and bound, in order for you to be raised up, you have to be loosed. You have to be loosed. And so what's happening? One of these spiritual blessings that are ours in Christ in the heavenly places is this freedom. Think about Jesus. He comes into his hometown. He walks into the synagogue. He picks up the scroll of Isaiah. He opens it up to Isaiah chapter 61. He reads out loud. And what does he read? The spirit of the sovereign God is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel. He is the good news. He has sent me to what? Release the captives. To set free the prisoners. To announce the Lord's coming and His day of vengeance. Jesus closes the scroll. He sets the scroll down. What does He say? This day this thing has come to pass. What did Jesus do? Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 10, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that you might have life and that life more abundantly. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Jesus came to bring freedom. And so not only have we been made alive, but those bondages to the world, the flesh, and the devil have been loosed by the grace of Jesus Christ. And then what? By nature, children of wrath. That's where we were. We were dead. We've been made alive. We were bound. We've been raised up. We were by nature, children of wrath. What has happened? And seated us with Him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. The trajectory of our lives because of original sin, because of total depravity, because of this death that we're living out, we are the walking dead, living but dead, bound in sin, by nature children of wrath, headed for hell. God in Christ has made us alive, raised us up, and seated us with Him in the heavenly places. Let me ask you this. How secure is that? How secure is that work? Well, let's back up. What did you do to deserve it? Nothing, okay? Well, we will agree with Jonathan Edwards that the only thing that you contributed to your salvation was the sin that made it necessary. 
That's it. You want a contribution? There's your contribution. That's it. Which means what? You did nothing. (laughs) You did nothing to deserve it. And yet, He gave it. Why? With the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead, He made us alive. He did it. Not only did He do it, He made us alive. That's great. He freed us. That's awesome. And then what? Seated us with Him in the heavenly places. Which means that that work of redemption, that work of freedom, that work of bringing to life is spiritually locked up in Christ in heaven. Where is Christ? Seated at the right hand of the Father, ruling and reigning until He makes every enemy His footstool. That's how secure the work of Christ's salvation is for you. You did nothing to deserve it, which means what? You can't do anything to mess it up. Are you able to ascend into heaven and arrest your redemption from the hands of Christ Jesus the Savior? You are not. And neither is anybody else. That's how secure His work is. He's raised us up and seated us with Him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Why? So that, Paul says, in the coming ages, He might show the immeasurable riches of His grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. And He says it again, just in case you missed it the first time. By grace, you have been saved. Through faith. And what? This is not your own doing. But brother, I prayed a prayer. Good for you. You should pray. I raised my hand. I walked an aisle. I came forward. I went to the altar. Man, praise God. I'm so glad that you had that moment and that opportunity to seal the work that God was doing in your life. But that is not what saved you. God saved you in Christ and by the work of the Holy Spirit. He has done the work. And this is not your own doing. But I chose. Yeah, you did. You did. Why? Because the work of the Holy Spirit came and raised you to new life. You were dead and you never could have chosen Christ unless the Spirit had already come and made you alive. And now what does that mean? My nature which once was a child of wrath has changed. And now I'm a child of God, which means what? I can now choose those things that before I never would have. It's not even that you... I mean, it is that you couldn't have, but you wouldn't have. And now, in this great grace which you have received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 5. Those desires continue to be changed by the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. And this is what we call sanctification. For by grace you've been saved through faith. Verse 8, this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are His workmanship. Why was all of this work done? Because God wanted to take His crowning creation, which was man, of whom He said it was very good. But it wasn't perfect, was it? It wasn't perfect in the garden. Why wasn't it perfect in the garden? Because sin was still possible. And now, by God's grace, through the person and work of Jesus Christ, the power of the Holy Spirit that comes and regenerates the lives of those whom God has set His affection, there will come a day where sin is completely eradicated from our lives. In Christ's death and blood on the cross, the penalty of our sin has been removed completely. Praise God. But as we live this life in the flesh, what do we still find ourselves facing? The power and presence of sin remains. 
And over the course of our lives in that process of sanctification, whereby the Spirit is changing our desires so that we want the good that God is instead of our own selfish things. And we're sanctified. The power of sin is losing its grip on us as we progress through our lives. And ultimately, on that day when we either pass from this life into the next or Jesus comes, whichever comes first, we will be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of the eye, where not only will the penalty of sin have been removed, not only will the power of sin over us completely be gone, but the presence of sin itself will be completely done away with. And we will at that time truly, in the most complete way, finally be saved. Amen? This is a work of God. Praise God. So where is all this coming from? Why are we talking about this? We talked about the Reformation. And I want to give you just a little bit of background to wrap up and close here today. But what we talked about today in total depravity is the first of five uh, points that are called the doctrines of grace. Now we, we said earlier uh, today that 506 years ago the Reformation began. That event was brought about when Martin Luther, who was at the time an Augustinian monk in the Roman Catholic Church, nailed what are called his 95 theses to the door of the Wittenberg Church in Germany. Now, we like to kind of make a big deal out of that because it's just kind of fun and there's all kinds of memes that float around around October 31st about Luther nailing these things, you know, to the door. And my favorite one is usually when there's a bunch of monks around and, and he's like, hey, your theology's broken and he nails it. He says, there, I fixed it. Um, you know, and, and we can have a lot of fun with that. But at the end of the day, he wasn't doing anything special. Uh, the door of the ch castle church in Wittenberg was used like a bulletin board. And if there were things that you wanted to discuss with the broader community, you would go and you'd nail these things to the door. That happened all the time. Luther had probably done that with other things before. Uh, but on this particular day, some of his students got a hold of those 95 theses. They went around the block to the printing press and they ran off a bunch of copies. And this was like a viral moment in the 1500s, in 1517, when that got distributed all across Germany. And now all of a sudden, not just a few people that were part of the college in Wittenberg, but now all of Germany is talking about these things. And it sparked what we know today as the Reformation in the beginning of the Protestant church. Now, Luther was not interested in creating a new church. He was interested in calling the church back to its origins, back to, like we said earlier, to recover the, the teaching of the church from the beginning, specifically the glories of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the grace of God, which is ours in him. That was in 1517. But if you fast forward a hundred years, uh, you end up in a new era where the Reformation has happened. Those who are part of the Reformation have been declared anathema by the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, if you remember, that is a biblical word. Anathema comes from uh, the book of Galatians when Paul says, if I or anybody else or even an angel from heaven come and preach to you a gospel of a different kind, he says, let him be anathema. In other words, let him be damned. And he's including himself. Remember he said, if I or anybody else or even an angel from heaven come and preach to you a gospel of a different kind than that which you already received, he says, let him be damned. Uh, and, and so the Roman Catholic Church, after the Reformation, they said, hey, guess what, guys? Uh, we don't like what you've done so much. Uh, you are anathema to us. And so in 1545, the Roman Catholic Church held the Council of Trent. That was a long time ago. Maybe things have changed. Well, in 1870, the Council of Vatican reaffirmed the Council of Trent. In 1965, the Second Vatican Council reaffirmed the Council of Trent. In 1995, by papal decree, Pope John Paul III uh, said that Trent's conclusions maintain all value. 
And in 2007, Pope Benedict renewed what John Paul III had said in 1995. So just so you know, in case you didn't, according to the Roman Catholic Church, your presence here today is considered heretical and you are uh, considered anathema according to the Roman Catholic Church, meaning damned. And that wasn't just something they said in 1545. It's something they continue to say even to this day. Now, let me caveat a little bit. Most Roman Catholics don't know that today. Very few believe it today. But those that matter who are in authority do know it and believe it and affirm it. And so it's important to understand that as Protestants, uh, that word means protest, protestants. We are still protesting. Uh, the reason that we're here today is because we are still protesting that the true teaching of Scripture has been lost in the Roman Catholic Church. And we would like nothing more than for Rome to repent, for the Pope to repent, and to embrace the authority of of Scripture over and above uh, papal um, decrees and councils and all the rest. And so, when the church at large declares a large group of people to be damned, um, that creates a bit of a problem. And, uh, and so, what ended up ensuing in the years following 1517, in fact, in uh, just a few years, um, the Pope would issue a papal bull saying that Luther himself was anathema, that he was a heretic, and that basically you would be doing the church a favor if you killed Martin Luther. That's, that's how it went. And so right after he took his famous stand where he said he could neither go against conscience or scripture, it was not good or safe, here I stand, he said, I can do no other. Uh, he was whisked away and some friends actually kidnapped him pretending to be um, like, like bad guys. Um, they kidnapped him and carried him away actually for his own safety because he was about to be taken and executed for being a heretic. You end up having what ends up being an 80-year war uh, in Holland uh, between the Dutch and the Spanish because the Spanish were Catholics and the Dutch were Reformed. They were Protestants. And then in the midst of a 12-year um, truce, which then ended in a 30-year war ensued after that, a very important thing happened. And you have some people that were calling themselves the Remonstrants. They were Protestants who now remonstrant like Protestant also means protest. And so they were Protestants who were protesting now the Protestants. And they said, we don't like what you've been saying. We think it should be different. And they brought five points of remonstrance uh, to the church. And so something called a synod was gathered together in Holland in a place that's called Dort. And they met for over six months, 180 meetings uh, of people gathered from all over Europe. Pastors and theologians and churchmen were gathered for over six months and 180 meetings to first hear what these remonstrants had to say and then to respond to what they said according to their study of Scripture. And what came out of that is what we know today as the doctrines of of grace. These are, and, and, and it's important to understand that what they said was not just a, hey guys, we've been bored, we got together, and we thought it'd be a good idea to present these things to you, but rather they were the answers to the protests that the remonstrants had brought to them. And so the remonstrants had five main points. And so each of the five points that the Synod came back with were in answer to those protests, and they are labeled here as total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and perseverance of the saints. Now that's in English. 
um, the Synod took place in Holland. And so all of this was written in Dutch. And so what's happened is this has been anglicized, it's been put into English, and it's been formed into an acrostic to help people. Remember I talked about shorthand is a way for us to be able to discuss things without having to unpack like I'm doing right now for so long. And so each of those five answers to the remonstrance became known as the five points of the doctrines of grace, or sometimes referred to, usually by its critics, as the five points of Calvinism. And that's because during that hundred years, uh, while Martin Luther sparked the Reformation, God used a man named John Calvin, who was a Frenchman in exile in Switzerland, to really fan into flames uh, what became the Reformation movement. And so even at this time in 1618 and 1619, the, the terminology of the remonstrance as they came and called these people Calvinists, it was actually a pejorative term. It wasn't meant to be something that was nice. They meant it as an insult, that they're just following this guy. And if John Calvin had been alive at that time, he would have himself had his own protest movement uh, to say, I don't want to be associated. I don't want my name being associated with anything. Not that he disagreed with what they were saying. He just didn't want to be the guy. He lived his life to lift up the name of Jesus, not himself. Uh, and so to this day, uh, Calvinism is usually uh, used in a pejorative sense. Now, in more common times, some people have, and, and we kind of tend to do this sometimes, it's kind of a defense mechanism. You know, someone makes fun of you and, and you just embrace the, the moniker that they might level against you. I never figured that out as a kid. I was short. I got labeled all kinds of short names. I never was like, yeah, that's right. I'm shorty. What are you going to do? It didn't didn't work for me. <laughs> I was still, I, I didn't like being short, so I, I, it wasn't good. But some people have said, hey, you mean that as a pejorative towards me, but I'm just going to embrace it. Yeah, I agree with what John Calvin said and would love to talk to you about it, right? And, and so uh, some people don't have a problem with that. But usually, uh, when we're talking about it in, in a sense that we're saying, no, this is a good thing. And what the church did here in answering this remonstrance and saying, no, this is actually what Scripture says, not just what somebody's idea was. Uh, we refer to it as the doctrines of grace because what these doctrines represent is the sovereign grace of God that is extended to sinners like you and me because Christ came to die for the ungodly. And so there's something that happens when we finally understand that we really were born dead in trespasses and sins. When we really understand there really was nothing good in me that God saw that He would choose me. But rather, He came and by free grace, He made me alive. He freed me. He raised me up. All of this I have found in Him is from Him and for him, that ought to bring a great deal of humility. Now, it doesn't always. And usually if you run into someone who says that they believe in the doctrines of grace or that they're a Calvinist and they are not humble, there's a disconnect somewhere. Okay? Because these things ought to bring a great sense of humility. Now, Here's a caveat. Sometimes people interpret um, confidence in a position as arrogance. And that ought not to be so. Just because someone is able to confidently say, hey, this is what I believe according to what Scripture says, that's not arrogance. It's just confidence. And some people are intimidated by confidence. On the flip side, when you are confident, sometimes you can present an air of arrogance that maybe you don't even mean to represent. And so we need to be careful with that 
not just with the doctrines of grace, but with anything that we claim to believe, these things ought to lead us in humility, not in arrogance. And so um, we don't have to apologize all over ourselves for these things, but we ought to recognize when there is an air of arrogance in our lives. And what these things refer to is what we call soteriology, which is the doctrine of salvation. And so what we want to do over the next five weeks is we want to talk about these different doctrines. Today, total depravity. Um, Next week, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and perseverance of the saints. These are the five points of the doctrines of grace that refer to the sovereign work of God in salvation. That it is, just as Paul said it, a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And so we're going to investigate the wonderful treasure and inheritance we have received from God in Christ and by the Spirit, this salvation and great grace which we have received, in which we stand, and by which we are being saved. I had maybe 15 other pages of historical notes and different things I'm not going to get to today. And so let me say this. If any of this today, over the next five weeks, even in the weeks after that, as you think about these things and, and, and digest them and, and whatever, if you have questions, ask. Ask Joel, ask myself, ask John. Schedule a meeting with us. We would be so happy to sit down and talk about any of these things with you. If what you are experiencing uh, in hearing these things is anything less than hope, peace, rest, assurance, that means that there's a disconnect somewhere. And we'd love to help make that connection for you so that you can receive these things with joy and not with trepidation. Um, With that being said, let's pray. Father, thank you for your word today. And God, the rest that it does bring to our souls. That we've not been invited into some kind of pointless striving after something that we cannot attain on our own. But rather, God, you in your grace and love have come to us. You made us alive. You raised us up. And you have seated us with Christ in the heavenly places such that there is nothing that we have done to earn this and there is nothing that we can do to ruin it because it is your gift and it is your work and we are called merely to rest in your work and receive what you have done and to give you praise for it. God, I pray that if there is anyone here today that has not yet experienced that raising, God, that that coming to life and that raising and that assurance of that salvation. God, I pray that by your spirit, you would do that work in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you as we move to a time of communion. May we all feed on Christ in our hearts by faith today. God bless you.